Hello everyone. On this video, I'm going to cover our second installment of linear motion. So um, we have already talked about the laws of motion, uh, but here I'm going to talk about the laws of motion in terms of our uh, linear motion. So using some of the terminology now that we've been covering. So the law of inertia in terms of linear motion says that if an object is at rest, it will not undergo any linear displacement, so change from one position or location to another, unless a force acts on it. Uh, if an object is in motion, the object will continue at the same linear velocity, so same speed and direction, with no acceleration or change in velocity, unless a force acts on it to change its velocity. Okay, law of acceleration in linear motion terms. Uh, the acceleration of an object is proportional to the net sum of the applied forces that cause the change and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Okay, so um, we've talked about the law of acceleration before, um, but just a little review. We're saying that the acceleration of the object directly depends on how much force is applied to that object. So more force applied to the object is going to result in more acceleration of that object. And then the acceleration is also inversely proportionate to the mass. So more mass of the object is going to mean less acceleration of the object when a force is applied. Um, so we can calculate the acceleration by dividing the sum of all the forces acting on the object by the mass of the object that's acting. So I want to point out that when we talk about the sum of the forces, we have to consider if those forces are all going in the same direction or if some of them might be opposing one another. Um, so in that case, like let's say we had some forces that are going in that direction and some forces that are going in that direction. We would have to define the forces going one way as positive and the force is going in the other direction as negative. Um, so it's contextual, it's not super important which ones we say are positive or negative. Um, what matters is that we are um, putting them in opposing directions. So what matters is that any force going in one direction is defined the same way as being positive or negative, and that any forces going the other way are defined in the opposite way. Um, so again, it's not super important if we say this is positive or negative, and then that's positive or negative. It matters that they're opposing one another. Um, so when we add the forces acting on the object, it's important that we are adding the forces in one way and subtracting the forces opposing them. So adding the negative forces that are opposing them to find the sum of the forces. And then we're dividing that sum by the mass. Uh, if acceleration and mass of the object are known, then we can solve for the sum of the forces. Um, so we're just shifting around the same equation so that mass times acceleration equals the sum of the forces. So, you know, depending on whether we're solving for the forces, the mass, or the acceleration, we'll use the same formula and just shift around the variables to solve for whatever we're trying to solve for. Okay, the law of uh, reciprocal actions says that there's always an equal and opposite reaction to every action. Um, so if the sum of all forces applied to a system is zero, then there's no net force and the system remains stationary. Okay, so like I was just saying, when we're adding the sum of the forces, it's really important that we consider the direction of those forces. So like for example, the force of gravity in the downward direction is equal and opposite to the ground reaction force exerted by the earth. And so if those are the only two forces, they cancel each other out because one is in a positive direction and the other is in a negative direction. Or we could say negative direction and positive direction, however we wanna define our problem. But the point is that they're going in opposite directions. So we would say one is positive, the other is negative. And so the sum of the two is zero, they cancel each other out. So when they cancel each other out, then that means that we have no motion, nothing, everything remains stationary. Now, let's say we have a person who is standing on the ground and um, so far the forces were equal, so there's no motion, he's just stationary standing on the ground. Uh, but now they produce muscle force 
to change the shape of the body and that muscle force is exerting a force into the ground. So now there's the force of gravity going down and the force that the muscles are exerting into the ground. And then the ground reaction force will be equal and opposite both of those forces together. Okay, so however much muscle force plus the gravity is what the ground reaction force will be equal to in the opposite direction. Okay, but what happens because now we're exerting muscle force and the force of gravity into the ground, now the ground reaction force is more than gravity because it's however much more to equal the muscle force that was exerting into the ground. Okay, so the ground reaction force now exceeds the force of gravity that was opposing it. And so now that ground reaction force will cause the person to jump off the ground or propel forward and gate or whatever it is that they're trying to do. Okay, the law of universal gravitation. Uh, weight is the measure of the gravity exerted by the earth on an object. Uh, so M is the mass of the body. G is a constant. That's the gravitational constant. Uh, so it's measured experimentally, assumed to be a constant of 9.81 meters per second squared. So if we multiply the mass of whatever the object is times the gravitational constant, that's what weight is. So although like if we went to the moon or to Mars or wherever, the mass would remain the same but the gravitational constant in all of those different places would be different depending on the amount of gravity exerted by the moon or whatever planet we're on on the object. So the gravitational constant would change, but when we're on earth, it's always the same because the earth is exerting the same amount of gravity on us. Um, so weight is just the mass times the gravity of earth. Okay, momentum is the quantity of motion of a system. So more momentum or more quantity of motion means more force must be applied to stop that motion. Okay, so momentum is determined by the mass of the object and the linear velocity of the object's travel. So linear velocity, again, is speed and direction. So the momentum depends on the speed and direction of the travel and how big or how much mass the object has. So momentum we find just by multiplying the mass times the velocity. Okay, linear impulse as an expression of the length of time that applied forces must act on a moving system to cause acceleration. Um, so I included this picture here so you could think about like if let's say you're pushing a car, like your car died and you're trying to push it, you put it in neutral and you're pushing it down the road. Now, if you apply a force, so you're pushing on the car, it's not enough to just apply a quick force and, and stop. You're not going to have barely any movement at all. But if you apply the same amount of force, but continue to apply it over a period of time, then you will cause acceleration of the car. You will cause the car to move. Okay, so linear impulse, we're saying that a greater change in linear momentum will result from application of either a larger force. So if I just pushed really fast, but did it with a bigger force, um, you know, like the Hulk, you know, come, <laughs> might come and smash the car, you know, one big force. Um, so a bigger force will, will cause more change in linear momentum or the same smaller force, but over a greater period of time of application of that force. Okay, so we can calculate that. Linear impulse is just another word for change in momentum. And we can calculate that by multiplying the sum of the force by the amount of time over which we're applying that force. So the change in time that's occurring while we're applying the force. So it's the sum of the forces times the change in time. And that is what our change in momentum is. And that's what linear impulse is. Okay, work is energy transfer, which is the capacity to perform work. Um, so we use the word work casually in our everyday language to mean like we're working hard or we're doing a lot, 
Um, but in physics, the term work is more tightly defined. Uh, so if an object is linearly displaced, so it's moving from one position to another, one location to another, if it's linear dis linearly displaced by an application of force, then work was performed. Um, if it was not linearly displaced, like the thing that we're acting on doesn't move, then there was no work, zero work. So we can calculate work by multiplying the applied force by the amount of displacement of the object caused by that force. So the, the formula there would just be work equals force times the displacement. So for example, if I stood up and just started pushing as hard as I could against the wall, um, I might be exerting a lot of energy and applying a lot of force, but if there's no displacement of the wall, if the wall doesn't actually move under my force, then I'm not doing any work. So no matter how hard I feel like I'm working, you know, in common language, I'm not doing any work if the thing I'm acting on isn't moving, if it's not being displaced. Okay, so no matter how much physical effort is applied, if the object is not displaced, no mechanical work has been performed. Power is the rate of performing mechanical work. Okay, so if we divide the amount of work that was done by the time that it took to do the work, that is power. Okay, so let's say I'm pushing something that I can move. Let's say I'm trying to slide a box on the floor. Okay, and so I'm applying a force and the box is displacing from one, so from one position to the next, I displaced the box. So if I multiply the force I applied by the amount of displacement, that was the amount of work. Then if I divide that by how long it took me to push that box, that was the power. So the shorter the time is, so the faster I push the box, the more power I used or I displayed. Okay, so the power goes up as the time elapsing goes down or as the amount of work done goes up. So if I apply more force or push it a greater distance or do it in a shorter time, any of those things will cause an increase in power. Okay, so let's say that I'm applying the force at an angle relative to the direction of the displacement of the object. So let's say I'm pushing that same box, but instead of pushing it in a direct path in the direction the box is moving, what if I'm pushing down at an angle on that box or up at an angle on that box and it's still traveling in a linear direction sliding on the floor? Then we have to account for the angle at which I'm applying that force because we're losing some of that force because I'm not completely parallel with the direction that the movement is taking place. I'm not parallel with it, so I'm losing some of the force that I'm applying because I'm at an angle. So to compensate for that angle, or to account for that angle, I should say, uh, when we're calculating, all we do is the same equation for work, but then also multiply cosine of theta. So whatever um, the angle is relative to the direction of the movement, that's theta in this case, and we would account for it that way. So that's why if there is no angle, we don't have to account for cosine theta because if the angle is zero, because the direction of the force is exactly parallel with the direction of the movement, um, then cosine of theta equals one. So we don't have to worry about that. But anytime theta is more or less than zero, then we need to account for it. Um, and then our work will be less because um, the angle is not zero. Okay, energy. Uh, mechanical energy consists of potential energy and kinetic energy. Uh, so potential energy is a system's ability to perform work based on its position, deformation, or configuration that has the potential to convert to kinetic energy. So something has potential energy when it's stationary, it's not moving, but because of where it is or what position it's in, or um, if it's been stretched, for example, uh, it will have potential energy that can be converted into kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy that happens when we are in motion. So we have different types of potential energy. One is gravitational potential energy. 
So that's potential energy of an object or a person um, that is due to that object's relationship or position relative to the Earth's surface. Um, so that's like if we have a skier up at the top of a slope and they're not moving, they're stationary, so they have potential energy, but because of their position relative to the ground below, um, they have gravitational potential energy because if they just shift just a little bit forward, now gravity is going to carry them uh, down that hill and now they'll have kinetic energy once they're moving. Um, so gravitational potential energy is the potential energy due to the position relative to the pull of gravity. Um, so we can calculate that by multiplying the mass of the object times our gravitational constant, 9.81, times the height of the object relative to the surface of the Earth. Okay, elastic potential energy is also called strain energy, and that's the potential energy due to deformation of an object. Um, and the best example would be like pulling the string on a bow and arrow or like in the picture, pulling on a slingshot, um, or it could be like blowing up a balloon. So as you blow up a balloon, it's being stretched with the, the pressure of the air inside of it. Um, so in all of those cases, we're stretching something, we're causing deformation of that elastic material. And so although in its stretched position, it's stationary, that means it has potential energy. And then when we let go, you know, you release the opening of the balloon and it flies all over the room, or you let go of the slingshot or you let go of the, the bow and the arrow flies, now that is converted into kinetic energy. So the amount of elastic potential energy depends on the stiffness of the material that's being deformed. Uh, so that's a constant that we abbreviate as K um, that's experimentally measured. So like the stiffness constant of um, a certain type of rubber or of a ligament or, you know, we can, so we can experimentally measure the stiffness constant of a material and it depends on the amount of deformation. So that would be um, delta X squared is just how we abbreviate that mathematically. Um, so that means that the strain energy or elastic potential energy, we can calculate by multiplying one half times the stiffness constant times the amount of deformation of that material. So kinetic energy is energy that an object has because it is in motion. Um, so we can calculate the kinetic energy as one half times the mass of the moving object times velocity squared. Um, so th what that means is that kinetic energy is very sensitive to changes in velocity because velocity is squared. So small changes in velocity are going to have a big effect on the total kinetic energy. Okay, so that is all I have for you in this lecture, and I'll see you for the next one.